Okay, I see it's 1215 exactly. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you had a very nice lunch and that you feel better after the break because we concentrated a lot this morning and we really, really enjoyed Prof Lister's uh, presentations this morning. It was so enlightening for all of us. It was really, really good. And I think I'm actually looking forward to tomorrow morning's presentations also from Prof Raymond. We will have tomorrow, we will have more time for discussions, but we can ask a little bit more questions on this Bloom's taxonomy and how to do it for programming. Uh, so we will have discussion time tomorrow to do that. I've seen there were quite a lot of people that still wanted to ask more questions on the use of the Bloom's taxonomy. And we will then do that tomorrow when uh, Prof. Lister is talking to us. Then uh, we're very glad to welcome Prof. John Greiling from Nelson Mandela University. He's an associate professor and HOD in computer science at Nelson Mandela University in Quebec, South Africa. I, uh, he is mainly involved in teaching and research related to programming. Since 2017, he has been coordinating the Unplug Coding project, mainly with the Tanks Coding app, introducing learners to coding without the use of a computer. The project has reached around 25,000 learners across South Africa and tar targeted disadvantaged schools without computer labs. In 2021, he has been coordinating online and physical coding off offline workshops reaching nearly 1,000 educations in South Africa. We uh, want to welcome here him, and we're very, very glad that we can learn from him. I've seen some of the thanks, uh, uh, thanks program, and I must say I was very, very impressed. So thank you very much, Prof. John, and we're glad that you can tell us about your program. Thank you very much. I've really been looking forward to this. Because every presentation I make is kind of an, a new reflection on where we currently are. Uh, and I feel a bit humbled speaking after a researcher, because I'm not a researcher. I'm just going to tell you stories. Uh, but I think it, it has some value, our experience. Uh, Bertie, if you don't mind, I did change the title slightly. When Bertie and myself agreed on the title well, a month or two ago, we said at the dawn of the fourth industrial revolution, but if we really fair with ourselves, the dawn has passed already. Uh, people are really talking about the dawn of the fifth industrial revolution, but that kind of just emphasizes the urgency of what we do. We're not at the start of the fourth industrial revolution. The rest of the world is finished with it <laughs> and we're still trying to catch up. So I thought I'd just remove the dawn because that's not factually true. Um, I want to start with this photo, and if I was in a classroom, I would have asked you how many of you recognize the photo at the top. It's of uh, Richard Akoto from Ghana. I think about four or five years, five years ago, he put this photo up on Facebook of him teaching Microsoft Word to his class on a blackboard. This photo went viral within days, and I, I can't remember how many thousands or tens of thousands of people shared it and looked at it. And literally within a week, he was starting to receiving laptops and PCs from all over the world. That's a photo at the bottom. And soon we had the photos on Facebook of him actually now teaching his learners on laptops. And I, I'm in communication with him. I, I guess he's not too good in English, so he answers in very short sentences. But I want to acknowledge this spirit in Africa, and I'm doing this because I don't want to say people are not doing this. And I've seen this all across South Africa as well. Individuals, schools, NGOs, really doing their best to bring the fourth industrial revolution to their communities. And nothing that I'm going to say today takes away the effort that they put in. I, I just want to emphasize this. I found this article on computer education in Kenya. And I think anyone from probably the vast majority of countries in Africa and many that this is a, a generic problem. The lack of computers, dysfunctional laboratories. The photo on the right hand side, I took at a, a school near Mtata where all the PCs were stacked on top of each other and we were doing our games in front. These PCs are clearly not functional anymore. 
Computers are expensive. So it's not a it's not a cheap device that you need in schools. And I don't need to remind any of us. I've just had that stress for two minutes now in my life. The lack of electricity and the concept of load shedding. But we, we think load shedding is bad. There's worse than load shedding. There's schools that for two, three, four days, for a week, for two weeks, does not have electricity. The lack of internet is probably even a bigger problem than electricity. The lack of qualified teachers, and once again, I'm not saying, our, I'm not pointing fingers to our teachers, but our teachers have been trained in other subjects. Uh, and we have very few teachers in our country that have been trained in coding and uh, programming. And then something that I never thought of until I read it in a research paper, and then I started noticing it. And it's just not, it's not only true for teachers. It's true for anyone that has never before worked on a laptop or a PC. They can do much more complex things if you don't put them in front of the laptop for the first time. And they call it teacher intimidation, uh, which is a, a, a real thing that we need to acknowledge. And then the issue of security. Two years ago, a school year in Koberga, at gunpoint in the middle of the school day, 120 tablets were stolen from them. And, and I think we, we understand this, this issue uh, that as soon as you put e expensive devices in a school or in the hand of a child walking to school or on a taxi or on a bus, you, you create a security risk. And, and Bertie will appreciate that um, we have just in a six day workshop that the things that I'm saying here, I understand more than six weeks, six days ago, are very emotionally loaded statements. Uh, but, and I acknowledge that, but I want to say that for me, these, the, these are realities that we cannot ignore when we think computer education in the whole of Africa. The harsh realities in Africa statistics. Now, I'm going to admit that this article is three, four years old that says there's 16,000 schools in South Africa that do not have computer labs. Maybe there's a thousand, thousand less than four years ago, but I don't think there's an order less. Um, this is a real problem. Remember, we only have 25,000 schools in the country. And in Ghana, 5% of the secondary schools do not have computers. And then the one at the bottom is, is really, really shocking. Nearly 90% of the learners across our continent do not have access to computers. And now this is probably my most emotionally loaded slide of my whole presentation. And I'm saying, is this the, our best solution to reach our children talking, thinking about the digital divide? And up front, I want to say, I'm not saying this is the wrong solution. As Richard Akota did, and I acknowledge what he's done, anyone that can put labs in their schools and get their kids in labs, I want to give full credit. When I ask this question, I'm not saying, is this the wrong solution? I'm saying, is this the best solution to reach the majority of our children in our continent and in our country? And at this stage, things might change in the future. At this stage, I'm saying categorically no. This cannot be our best solution. Because if we see this as our best solution, we are saying that those kids that are not in labs, their problem is not solved. Uh, and, and we need to think about this and really reflect on this. So how do we get him across the digital divide? And I, had a, and I trust that Jimmy Shabangu is in with the conversation now. I had a long chat with him this morning on LinkedIn after I used this photo to kind of promote my talk today. And Jimmy responded and we had a very constructive discussion in which he said, why do we always show the African child in this way? Um, can't we be more positive? And um, I will, I will reflect about this because I, what, what he's saying is something that we can't ignore. But what I see in this photo says nothing negative about the African child. 
uh, I think it says nothing, something negative about the, the adult on our continent. And if I have to be blunt about the governments on our continent. What I'm seeing here is learners that are curious, that I want to learn, that want to cross the digital divide. And we might perceive this as negative, uh, but we can't ignore the reality if we want to find solutions. I am saying it's definitely negative about the leadership and the adults on our continent. So the Tangible Africa project um, is an engagement partnership between our Department of Computing Sciences and the Lever Foundation and NPO in the city, which, which I see as my rollout partner. Um, I just don't have enough capacity as an HOD and a department to do the rollout. So Lever Foundation has been a very strategic rollout partner for the past three years. And I have to acknowledge that this cannot be done without them. Uh, we've now reached over 50,000 learners in direct workshop by our own facilitators. That's how I get to the 50,000. Uh, our kits have been distributed to over 600 schools. So if, if we are to counting the schools and what they've done in their schools, in their classrooms, which I can't count. I want to say we've probably reached over 100,000 learners since 2017, but counting becomes actually a problem. I should stop counting. It was easy when only us did workshops, but it's now become impossible. Our name, Tangible Africa. Um, tangible obviously means you can touch the code. And, and the Tanks app, which I'll show just now, will show you that you can literally touch the, touch the puzzle pieces. But for us, Tangible is a, as a higher level concept. It makes something that is very abstract to most teachers and most learners in our schools, something that becomes concrete, something that they can grasp, something that they can understand. And because of that, um, I've taught now 1,500 teachers in short training workshops of four hours. Code has been demystified for them. I can literally see their eyes light, lighten up in the first hour. I'm not saying they now see sharp or Python programmers. I'm just saying the concept of coding, which causes fear and anxiety amongst teachers to start off is taken away and for me this is if, if i can only do that uh, we've succeeded but hopefully we're doing slightly more uh, just on our, our logos we're very excited about our logos um, they all based on our actual puzzle pieces so we use different logos but they use the, the the basic design of our puzzle pieces so that's just a design a brag but i won't refer to that again you can just see that they actually change as we carry on so when this project at the, at the start, it was just tanks. When me and my honor student in January 2017 came together in my office, these were literally our objectives. We said we want to introduce coding to learners without the need of computers, but we agreed that we'll use phones. So up till last year, I used the concept of unplugged coding until purists told me unplugged means no devices. So I now kind of play safe and I say offline coding. We said to each other, we need to be able to do this in schools that have no electricity at, on that day and definitely no internet. Uh, we said to ourselves, we don't want to need three weeks of training. We want to go into and do four, four hours of training and the teacher must be empowered to do something. It had to be a low budget intervention. Because uh, this, this was born not from only Byron Batterson's vision, but from students telling me, over the past 30 years, Prof, when are you coming to our townships? When you are coming to my rural school, the kids there don't know about programming. And these schools don't have the budgets. So we said our intervention has to be low budget. But we're also very serious that it's got no compromise on quality. We're not going to teach uh, superficial things that doesn't make, make a meaning, doesn't make sense. And then the fun activities. And this I read two months ago. I don't know whether you've realized that in the past 15 to 20 years, how important stand-up com comedy has become in our culture, in our world. Well, we've got probably our biggest export in Trevor Noah. And they say the reason for that is that all of us, adults and children, have been thrown 
with so much technology and information overload that the only way for us to survive is to have fun, is to have comedy in our lives. And they say that's literally the reason why stand-up comedy is now much more popular than 20 years ago. So for us in, in teaching coding at school, we are very hesitant of throwing the kids with just more stress. We would rather make it fun. Get them on the, on our side regarding coding. And then in third year university, they can have the stress and an honors, which they need to have to become brilliant programs. But let's not throw stress at them in primary school. Uh, and we that was our view in 2017 already. So why should we teach coding robotics in our primary schools? Um, I want to focus on primary schools because our program mainly focuses on primary schools, although what we do is relevant up to grade 12 and even the parents of my students enjoy it. So why do we teach coding robotics? And the first answer is not to produce software developers. And this is again probably a very loaded statement. Bertie will appreciate that I'm now very sensitive about making loaded statements. But let's say it's my opinion. Um, it's my opinion that whether a child can code at the end of grade seven and write fancy programs is not for me the purpose of coding in robotics. And I'm open for disagreement. And I think there's probably room for different views. But this is the, the, the way that we look at our project. There is a desperate shortage of software developers in South Africa, and if I read, start reading across Africa. So for us, it's very important that the learner becomes aware of these careers, because in, in our discipline, I've also been involved in marketing for 30 years of our discipline to schools. We compete with the professions. We compete with engineering, with accounting, with law, with medical. And, and we're not a profession. We kind of have 300 different careers that we're trying to sell to kids. And it's much easier than to choose engineering. So for us, it's critically important that the learners in primary school become aware of this discipline, whatever you want to call. But then I want to repeat, no fear or anxiety added. That this must be something that sounds enticing and nice to them at primary school. And then and for us, this is the important one. When we teach coding and robotics at school, coding is one of the 21st century skills. It's not the only one. Uh, and I don't need to say this. We all know this, these skills. Um, and in a sense, if I look at it as a programmer for primary school, teacher for primary schools, I'm saying that coding is, just becomes my tool, and robotics, obviously, becomes my tool to teach the, the learners the other skills. And the emphasis must be on the other skills, not on the coding and the robotics. It must be a tool. Again, a loaded statement. And I'm, I'm open for people that think differently and they are welcome and they might they will also be correct. But that's the that's the perspective at which we look at, look at offline coding. And then need I say this for the coding fraternity, software development fraternity. We need more metrics at the end of metric that pass with a good maths mark. And if I, if I want to address the, the needs of our economy, some of the coding and robotics curriculum in the primary school must ultimately lead to this. I'm trying to find the statistics, but I'm, I'm kind of sure that at the end of every year, our schooling system is producing less metrics with good maths. And that is a much bigger problem than having grade sevens that can't code. Uh, because we 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 recruiting and competing with the other disciplines from a shrinking pool. While the the, the need for software developers in our economy is exponentially, I want to say, increasing. And this is this is the real thing that keeps me awake at night as an academic. So our project and the South African schools, we, we do not see our project becoming a textbook or aligning with the curriculum, whatever the curriculum looks like. That's not our purpose. Um, 
we just don't have, I don't have the capacity. My team doesn't have the capacity. It's not our vision to become a, a part and parcel of any coding and robotics curriculum uh, at school. Uh, for that, we would need much more capacity. We just don't, can't. We'll never write textbooks. Uh, we'll never convince DBE that it must be included as part of a curriculum. That's not our purpose. We see our role as introducing coding to teachers primarily at this stage and to learners, taking away the fear of coding. And then definitely enhancing computational thinking and problem solving skills. That is our, our main drive, not coding. And I think we have a huge responsibility to take the fear and anxiety about coding away from teachers. And obviously our focus and our is on the schools without computers. Although I'm finding a growing number of schools well resourced that are also saying that this, this offline or unplugged way has definite value, even if we have the best resourced laboratories. And we see what we do rather roll out in coding clubs, like chess clubs, post-curricular, outside curricular activities. And that's where our focus is, and that's where we've had the most success in schools, is outside the curriculum, outside the school hour, a coding club like a rugby training session after school. And I'll get to that soon. So just to repeat, and I, I'm bringing this back the whole time. Uh, Keith Gibson told me this. He's a legendary IT teacher. It's probably a general uh, saying, but I've heard it from Keith Gibson. You cannot translate from French into English if you cannot speak French. So a very important part of our project is introducing problem solving and computational thinking. Loose from coding, before you code, or parallel to coding, not as coding. Because you're saying if you can't solve problems, if you can't think computationally, to try and code just doesn't make sense. Uh, and if you teach kids how to code and it doesn't enhance problem solving and computational thinking, it also does not make sense. Uh, and uh, again, a loaded statement, but this is our perspective and this is how we plan our project. And then when we talk to teachers, and I'm not going to go into this, all of you know about this, we try to make them aware of the online resources available for free. Uh, the IITPSA Talent Search with all their previous papers. It's all challenges that you don't need computers for. Co.org. One of the teachers literally went on Pinterest. I wasn't aware of that. And got ex excellent examples from Pinterest. But then uh, part of our project I, I commissioned Keith Gibson with a huge respect for his view on computational thinking. And he compiled a, a, a 40 activities. A few were borrowed, but most of them are new, and he, he references the borrowed ones. 40 computational activities that kids can do in class or in coding clubs. And if anyone is interested, you just email me and I'll email it to you. We don't sell these, these things. It's for, important for us to get teachers to start doing these activities in class. One of my favorite photos of the past two years, I received it from Selby Makuna from Hazyview. He did extra maths classes, and then while the kids were waiting for the taxi, they said to him, Prof, ah, so we want some of those exciting examples that you gave us. And he took one example from Keith's compendium, and these are the kids solving the problems on the pavement while waiting for the taxi. There is so much, so much story behind this photo that I get goosebumps every time I see it. So for the foundation phase, what do we try and introduce in foundation phase? First of all, I spend the first hour in saying to teachers, listen, if you want to introduce coding to your learners, spend a few weeks just getting them to play the very traditional games that are an example of coding or a list of instructions. And hopscotch throughout Africa is well known. And that's the first one people always think of until we start talking about what coding really is. Simon Says, Twister. And then it's very interesting as I travel through the provinces that people come up with indigenous games that are also a list of instructions. So the demystifying coding starts with step one where you just say to people, listen, Coding is a list of instructions that tells a computer what to do. 
when you write a recipe, it's a list of instructions that tells the chef what to do. And when you play certain games, you're applying a list of instructions. And this, this you could do for a whole term. Remember, we're in a no rush. We don't need developers at grade seven. We need to kind of just open this world to them. And if I had more time, I could do more. Talk about more. And then we've put, a, put together 10 lessons. Uh, we call it the boats lesson plans with printed resources, etc. I'm just going to quickly show you visuals of some of the lessons. What is coding? Uh, where you get these posters and the kids respond to where they put the, the, the shoe, where they stand re relevant to the chair. And we teach them coding as a list of instructions. So re they're responding to the instructions. Sequencing, you give them a list of posters and they've got to sequence these posters in an order to make tea. Uh, this is the shoe example taken in a very under-resourced school in Mtata. Thinking like a computer. You give them some recycled objects, you give them categories, and they've got to ask the if question to recite, to categorize these recycled. Uh, and all of this is low cost, there's no high cost intervention. Types of instructions. We teach them, OK, we've shown you the posters that let you move around a chair, but now go and draw your own instructions on how to brush your teeth. And then when they've done that, you say, OK, you've written your first program. Left, right, forwards and backwards. The, 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 I think we all know the grid mat where you move stuff and they can physically do it in class. Now, if I had 15 minutes, I would say to you, write an essay on the body language that you see here and tell me, do you think there's some computational thinking happening here? I'm subjective, but I have to agree that there is some computational thinking happening there. Just looking at the body language. Different views, spatial orientation, the, the grade one and art teachers tell me that know about coding, that being able to understand different views is critical. And this one, the, the learners were asked to draw their bedroom from the top and from the side. Or you take the lunchbox and you say, draw your lunchbox from the top and from the side or from different angles. Debugging. This photo was taken in a rural school in Tsomo where the learner was given a very basic debugging activity. Playing against the partner, so our foundation phase links up with the Boats app, where the learners can toggle commands and do the move forward, turn left commands on the app. And then they can play against each other or they can participate in tournaments. I won't say much about this, but we've had tournaments with 700 learners playing all across the country. If any teachers are listening, our next one will be in September the Heritage Month uh, Boats Tournament, and we hope to have thousands of kids playing. So please let me know if you want to register so we can keep you updated. So the intermediate and, and senior phases. The Tanks app was developed by Byron Batterson, and I always acknowledge him because in my 30 years of being a lecturer, this was one of the best honest projects that I've seen. And I always say people have had to go out and pay a software company to develop tanks. It will most probably cost me at least half a million rand. So Byron is still very much part of the project and very aware of what's happening. Uh, so I keep on acknowledging him for the great work he did in 2017 and for the vision he had. When he walked into my office, it was his vision and I just grabbed onto it. So the basic concept of coding of, of tanks is you get a tank on a screen. Your cell phone screen has got to reach a destination. You've got tangible puzzle pieces that you pack out. You take a photo of them and the code executes on the screen. So the only expensive device here is a cell phone, which most teachers have. So in this scenario, the tank needs to move backwards, turn left, and then move forward twice. So the learner packs out the code using the puzzle pieces takes a photo of the code. When happy that it's the correct puzzle pieces that were recognized, you press yes and your tank moves. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the levels. Um, if you look at this one, I'm gonna go out of presentation mode so that we can play a bit, yeah? The tank has to go forward, turn right, go forward three times, turn right and go forward the fourth time. But you only give the learners three move forwards. Uh, the, the teachers asked me to do this. So immediately at level three, they've got to think out of the box. 
And the, the way you solve that is go to start, move forward, turn right, move forward twice, and then since you only have you have used all your backwards, you turn the opposite direction and move backwards. Uh, and immediately the, the the child has to think. And some some learners pick this up very quickly. Others really need to think, and even teachers and adults. But uh, there's some nice problem solving happening in this example. In this one, the way which we introduce loops, we say to the teacher and the learner, move forward, move forward, turn right, move forward, move forward, turn right, move forward, move forward. And they've got a little trick uh, aspect in tanks that says um, early termination. So you, you, oh, John, you, you, I've, got yes. the, I've got the sound problem. Can you just repeat a little bit what you said in the last five or oh, ten sorry. seconds, please? Did you did you hear the slide? I'm a bit worried. Can people hear me? Yes, we can. I okay. think John, Prof. John, if you want to, you can maybe just uh, close your camera and we can save a bit of bandwidth. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I'll do that immediately. Uh, OK, apologies for that. OK, now I just need to get to my screen. Okay, so maybe I'll just repeat, I'll just repeat this one quickly. Uh, is the sound better now? Thank you. Okay. Very so good. What you, well, so what we have here is that you've got to move forward, turn right, move forward two times, turn right and move forward the fourth time, but you only have three move forwards. So we force them at the end to, well, they've got to think it up to turn the wrong way and move backwards. When we get to this one, I'll take out the R, we say to the, the kid, write down the commands that will take you to the star. And then they see this and they and we say to them, what what would you like to add here to, to get a real pattern? And they say, okay, now I would if I add an R, I will get a nice pattern. And we have got we've got this little trinket tank that we call uh, early termination. So when the tank reaches the star, it won't execute the rest of the code. So they have a pattern here, and so it's start, repeat. What do I repeat three times? Move forward, move forward, turn right. I'm going quick, very quickly through this. This this is, happens normally by the second hour of the training. But when you do it this way, the teachers understand loops and learners. I, I mainly work with teachers, but if teachers can understand it, I know they will know how to explain it to learners. Then we introduce the while loop. I'm not going to say much about that. It's simply while my path is clear, keep on moving forward. And because of the early termination, when it reaches the star, it stops. And I've trained 1,500 teachers, and I can assure you the vast majority, once we've explained this to them, I say to them, if I look at this code, how many times does the tank move forward? And then you explain to them, you've got the repeat here. You've got to repeat three times. What is Sorry, it I'm not sure time, if it's only my sound that's that bad. Uh, can some other oh. people just as well? Is the sound bad now? No, we are clear. Yeah, I have no problem. Okay, all right, it's clear now. I uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not changing anything on my side. So I don't really know what to do, but please shout if you can't hear me. So if you say to them, this body of the loop is repeated three times and it's all visual code, within 10 minutes they can do this. And they start understanding nested loops. What I'm saying is we're talking about a four hour training session. And it's not teachers that are fooling me. I can see, they say, ah, oh, and they understand it. So we've introduced the concept of nested constructs to them. The if statement. Um, without me even explaining the if statement. I say to them, look at this, use your gut feeling, understanding the infinite, and say to me, which of these two uh, challenges is, is has this as a solution? So this thing simply says, repeatedly ask, if my path is blocked, I must turn, if my path is not blocked, I must move forward, if it's blocked, I must turn right. 
and then clearly this is the solution. And as soon as it gets blocked, you turn right, turn right. And in a very playful way, you introduce the decision making if construct to a teacher. Remember, my principle is I'm not making them software developers. I'm using problem solving and I'm introducing coding concepts. We also realized last year, Kelly Bush is a teacher at Hudson Park that works with me on the content that we can't just talk coding and algorithmics. Um, we're not going to think design thinking, digital citizenship, computational thinking. So what, I've what Kelly has done, she's come up with storybooks for foundation phase and senior phases where the teacher can work through these stories. And as they work through these stories, they, they are introduced to design thinking and um, problem solving and computational thinking. She's a very experienced foundation phase teacher. So when she says something works, I know she's practiced with it for years and it will work. Quickly, just on the, the, the parts, components of uh, computational thinking. In this problem, the learners have to work out that I must first shoot away the rubble and then I must move. That's decomposition. This one, they must pick up that they need to repeat something five times to get to the start, pattern recognition. And this one they've got to see, but it's irrelevant. I don't need to shoot away the, the rubble abstraction. And then obviously I write down my code. So we have different lesson plans, instructional videos. I kind of daily now am sending out WhatsApps to learners across the country that get stuck in the game. And I, I WhatsApp them a little two minute video and they can continue. So we, our emphasis has been on keep it simple. We have very few big documents, except for the lesson plans. The rest is basic, short, two-minute videos that I can literally WhatsApp to anyone without using a lot of data. Typical workshops, they always work in teams. Um, this is the one is taken in our labs. The other one is in Kayamandi in Stellenbosch. Tournaments, I think Leanda is on, online. I think I heard her voice. This was a tournament we had at her school on six o'clock in the morning literally two months before COVID with 120 learners participating in a coding tournament. Coding clubs, as I said, critical for us. That's that's our main reach to schools. We see this as an extracurricular activity and it takes on various different forms. On the right hand side, you're seeing a coding club on Saturdays in Tsomo. On the left hand side, you're seeing Kala where the teacher put up the data projector with the videos over break and the kids were playing. And when they were finished, he said, OK, now you go and teach the younger grades. And I had a WhatsApp from him yes, last week. This is three years later, and they still do it. They're participating in our tournament in two weeks' time. This is Coding Club in Excelsior, an under-resourced school in Koberga with no labs. They've been running a coding club for a year, two afternoons a week with 40 to 60 kids participating. And I've asked this teacher now to write me, and she's busy this holidays, a compendium of all the activities that she's used over this year. We want to combine them into a booklet, which will also be distributing at no cost to whoever wants to start a coding club and you don't have a computer. The coding clubs has now led to the first time, three weeks ago, we had an inter-schools coding tournament with five of the let's say the top from some of the top schools, well-resourced schools in the city participating one afternoon. There were 130 kids from five schools. And do you notice the photo on the left says coding has become a spectator sport. I wish you could have experienced the vibe that afternoon. My team were so emotional that now and then they were all crying. To see kids coding, to see parents looking on, to hearing the cheering, the singing, Coding became something like a rugby match. And when I'm saying fun, this is what we want. We want the kids to think positively about coding. So train the teacher is, is, has been our main focus. Um, and we've trained about 1,500 teachers in physical and virtual workshops. Both work equally well. We are now going into a project with three of the major teacher unions which will conclude with, uh, through master trainers, training hopefully around 20,000 teachers across South Africa in, in offline coding. But the feedback I get from teachers is what is important to me. Coding has been demystified. They leave the session without the fear and the anxiety that they heard 
the first had the first time they heard about coding and robotics. They know where to start. And many don't start, but it's not the training's fault. It's just the program is too full at school, et cetera, et cetera. But they know where to start. They feel empowered. And because they have a wonderful four hours of training, I always say to them, if you don't laugh today, go and see a psychologist. You have too many problems. So they really enjoy the session, and this inspires them to go and share the fun with their kids. The the tangible Africa, the African Africa part of, of tangible Africa says we, we, we see ourselves across Africa in the next five years. We just received funding from Henley Business School in London to start a project in Rwanda and we're busy negotiating the logistics of this. Bringing back to the skills and we still say that we are, we want to introduce learners to all of these skills and, and we we probably subjective, but I think we are succeeding in the group work and all the other things that we are doing. Now, before I go to the next slide, my, my wife's grandmother once came back from church and she said it was a brilliant sermon. There were three places where the pastor could have stopped. Now, this is the first place where I could have stopped, but I'm going to carry on. If you look at this, these two photos and you think about the 21st century skills, Definitely, there are skills being enhanced and carried over on the left-hand side. Loaded statement, I'm qualifying. But I do think that more skills are being taught on the right-hand side. If I could enhance this photo and focus on different groups in this photo, you'll see communication, you see collaboration, you will see strategy happening here in that photo, which I struggle to see when kids are sitting in front of a lab, in front of a screen. On the 18th of July, we're having our Coding for Mandela coding tournaments. It started off with one tournament in Kaberga in March, and my team said to me, let's do it on Mandela Day. It has now kind of exploded in our face. I think we have, we're looking at 47 sites across the country with, if it happens, over 5,000 learners participating. What is happening because of this tournament beforehand? And this was a, a, a chat to someone now, we never expected this. People are preparing for this tournament like anything through the holidays. This is a WhatsApp I got yesterday from a teacher who's now challenged these learners to come to school so that they can prepare for the Mandela Day tournament. This is a guy I still wanted to ask him or her for where they are, doesn't ask. It's a WhatsApp I got while at the airport yesterday. This is the infamous level 34, very complicated. This is me drawing on the screen on my cell phone and answering him. And then he's saying, wow, now I understand. Um, and I'm seeing, and just in the solution and the way we tackle it, I'm seeing, I'm seeing decomposition. I'm seeing pattern matching and algorithm. I struggle to see abstraction, but the clever guys can probably. And this is a WhatsApp conversation between me and a learner. I don't even know his name. I don't know his gender, and I don't know where in the country. Then our last component of our project is we call it Impact Tomorrow. We don't have the resources yet to do this on a great scale because we've reached 50,000 learners, but we are trying our best to, when we identify talent, to say, how do we nurture this talent towards a degree in computer science? And the guy in the middle there, Tulumanku, is we call him our, our Tulumanku story. He played tanks in grade six in a school without no, any computers. He was one of those kids that no teacher no, ever noticed. He became very well of it with a lot of perseverance. I don't have time on that. He ended up becoming seventh in our national tournament at the end of grade seven. We lost contact with him, our fault. In the middle of grade eight, he WhatsApp me once saying, said, Prof, I'm in a dysfunctional school. I'm going to go nowhere. So we got a sponsorship and we convinced a school, Alexander Road, to taking him, although they were full. He's now a grade 11 learner, doing brilliantly in IT. And the other day he spoke to my team and he said he's, his vision is to do a PhD in computer science. The boy on the right-hand side is from a Primary school, yeah, in the city, very under-resourced. My team kept on talking about Norman, this bright little guy, very enthusiastic. 
Uh, the vice president of Amazon a month ago gave him a scholarship to go and study at Alexander Road after primary school. Um, and there's two others that we identified that the same person gave a scholarship to, David Brown, from his private capacity. This is the start of our little academy here in the city. Kids that complete all 35 levels are then given a four-week online c -sharp course. They use the videos I made during COVID for my students. When they've completed that course, we bring them into a group that meets on Saturdays, and they're going to get extra maths tutoring and also some coding. But physical process before they reach here. This is our first 10. This is in Tomo. The teacher, the, the facilitator there, Lusanda, identified four or five kids in the mountains that really show talent in coding and computational thinking, but also looking at their, their schooling marks. So the guy standing up there is an is a engineer in town, which came to and got to know about what she does, and he's now volunteered. We don't pay him. Every Saturday, he gives them extra maths and coding, maths and English tutoring, and Lusanda gives them some coding. The only expense for them is for Lusanda to get them on a taxi from the mountains into the town. And I checked yesterday, they're still coming every Saturday. On the left-hand side is, is the concept of a coding club. Another WhatsApp I received yesterday, uh, from Saturday maybe. They've started their own coding club in Fentersburg, Fentersdorp. Uh, and, and after we send them some coding games. The photo on the right hand side I received yesterday off at the airport at Oliver Tambu. A young guy from Katlehong. I've never met him. I don't know where he got my cell phone number from. He is so interested in coding robotics and he says, please help me. My school has no computers. No one around is me thinking of that. So we will be coding a game to him today. When he receives it on Wednesday, we'll send him instructional videos and he will start at home. My second last slide. Um, for us, the, the human issue is very important. On the left hand side is a, is a group of ladies in Soshangube who makes our grid mats. They had a little company that went bankrupt during COVID and we've revived their company and they've now made us, I think, already 400 grid mats. So they, they, they're earning an income. Wade on the right hand side, uh, and Jackson is my 2IB, the guy that helps me run the show. Wade on the right hand side packs our puzzles. He had a very serious accident at the age of 14 with brain damage. For the first time in his life, he's now 30, he's earning a regular income and it's added considerable value to him. I just wanted to know this because these are the heartwarming parts of the project that we really enjoy. And that's our team. We've got 30 coding evangelists all over the country, going into schools, going into communities, working with NGOs, and then giving us feedback. And we're hoping to add another 100 on the 1st of July all across the country. Thank you. If you want to follow our project, I I'm, I'm use LinkedIn the most. I post daily. And then on Facebook, our, our page's name is Tangible Africa. Thank you very much. It was it's really been a privilege to sharing with you and you're welcome to ask me questions now if you want to. Thank you so much, Prof. Freiling. We really enjoyed your presentation. I, I, I just want to uh, ask the people if, uh, if you can also put your questions on the chat. Otherwise, you can put your hand up, but please also put it on the chat because we want to use it later, all the questions on the chat for research purposes. Can we get some questions? I'll, I'll start answering the questions. Uh, the one about uh, contacting DBE so it's part of the, the curriculum. I would rather just talk to DBE about uh, making it coding clubs uh, to feed into coding clubs. Schools can obviously choose if they want to use the, the games as an additional tool in their club. But as I said, we don't have any aspirations of writing textbooks or becoming involved with that kind of endeavor. We'd like to keep it informal and fun. And, and But our main focus is uh, for coding clubs and informal activity, and then informal activity in the class. Uh, assessment, uh, no, we don't want to focus on assessment. Uh, we believe as soon as you start assessing, we're taking out some of the fun. 
I think the fact that our games are increasing levels of complexity from run to 35, the assessment is in the gamification, which kids already understand. So without them knowing that they're being assessed, they're improving. Uh, so the assessment is, can you do level five? Can you do level six? Can you do level seven? And I wish I could show you all the WhatsApps I'm getting from across the country as they assess themselves and learn. That's that's a great fun. Thanks, Prof. I think we will definitely have more questions. Uh, can we just uh, get more uh, questions? I want just want to ask Prof. Uh, uh, like you said, it is available. Is it available for free in any of the township schools? No. Well, free is a um, uh, we charge for the for the the puzzles. Uh, our business model up to now has been probably ninety percent corporate sponsors that we. Uh, uh, convinced to give us some of their CSI funding and then we make it available to schools. Uh, schools that buy them from us, a, a pack of games, uh, code uh, tokens is 150 Rand, uh, a kit, and a school only needs one kit, that's eight games with lessons, solutions, levels, etc. is 3,000 Rand for foundation phase and 3,000 Rand for senior phase. So we, we, we think we are still very much affordable. Uh, we can't make everything free. I'm, I don't get a salary out of this. I'm HOD. Uh, but you need to have some income to make it a sustainable project. That's how I kind of rationalize it. We don't give away anything, everything for free. Uh, but I think 150 Rand for a pack of five kids can play or 3,000 Rand for a school. I think it's more affordable than most other uh, interventions. That is true. <clears throat> that is really true. Do you have more questions? I'll as, check the, as, I don't see. Yes. And I just saw Namusa doing great work in, in Pumalanga, Vidbank area with our coding and other stuff. So she's one of our bright stars, really making an impact in Pumalanga with offline coding and breaching the, the under resourced schools. So I just want to give credit to Namusa. Thanks, Prof. Uh, I, I just for, uh, want to know, is there any other questions still? I see Joey has un unmuted herself, so maybe she wants to It's ask me that's Oh, is that you? <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> A question okay. on the chat box bro. from from victor yeah obviously all the teachers are trained are not in coding robotics because schools don't have coding robotics teachers so they're from different backgrounds the one that i know that has been very well accepted by teachers is the maths teachers uh one of my my facilitator george jerume from Milton in cape town is at amisa now he's got a paper accepted on how he used tanks in his maths tutoring and then Janine Ulifir is in Humansdorp uh, Secondary School. She's she's working towards registering for a master's on the impact of tanks and coding in a maths class. So the best feedback I've had is regarding maths. My wife, my wife is a grade one teacher. She says this had a lot to do with all the other skills they have to teach in, in, in grade one. So teachers say that generally, but I haven't really concretely put it in that on paper, except for maths. There's a lot of Anecdotal evidence at the state, I can't do it, call it research. They call it triggering the mind. When the kids start solving problems, whether it's tanks or just a Pinterest example, the mind is triggered. And they said that kind of triggers the mind to do better in mass. Um, but that's anecdotal observations at this stage. Uh, Prof, there's another one. It says, do you think self-efficacy uh, should be considered as a computational thinking skill? I'm not sure whether it's a computational thinking skill that people that are cleverer on these terminologies could answer, but I think it's a critical skill <laughs> for any learner. Uh, and um, if I understand self-efficacy correct, uh, we, we often pick it up that teachers say, we're starting to play in text and suddenly this kid that I never noticed before uh, becomes active, and not only in tanks, but also in the rest of the school. I think School of Manco is a good example I once went to train in Wolseley, probably not self efficacy but also something that I, and the headmaster came to me and said, Prof, we have a bunch of gangsters in the school. I'm worried for your training. We did play with the kids and the team that won was the, the biggest gangsters in school and they represented the school 
in a tournament in Wolseley. That's incredible, Prof, really. Um, I didn't see any other questions. Maybe we will give an uh, option for the last question. Yeah, I've got to, I've got to agree with Ian. Obviously, I must agree. <laughs> um, devices, it's good to have kids introduced to devices, but um, the old school, my graduates that are now, well, David Brown in Microsoft, someone that's a big developer in IT in the UK, all say to me, Prof, we started learning coding with our devices. Take away the devices as much as possible. Uh, but again, that's anecdotal, anecdotal comments from people. But I think if you're vice president of Microsoft and you're a brilliant, brilliant developer, I've got to listen to you. Thank you so much, Prof. We really, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, we will come back to you for uh, for some kids for some of our schools that we can maybe distribute the, uh, it to the schools in our areas. I know the, uh, uh, Polokwane and Sushangubi will definitely also join the club to be part of this whole project of yours. Thank you very much for your time and uh, we will get back to you soon. Tanya just asked, it. Tanya, if you could please email me, uh, then I can uh, respond. Um, my email address is on the last screen. Um, yeah, I will, I will definitely like it. And if anyone else wants uh, Keith Gibson's, Keith's um, computational activities, I'll, be, I'll email them to you. But just please email, because if you WhatsApp me, then I'd, I'm not at my laptop. When I read your email, I can respond immediately.